Reading Appropriation Language. Module 1, Annual and Supplemental Appropriations. These words in Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7 of the Constitution are known as the Appropriations Clause. No money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. Have you ever wondered how this clause is implemented? And what are appropriations made by law anyway? The Heritage Guide to the Constitution describes laws making appropriations as those expressly directing a payment out of a designated fund or source in the Treasury. In other words, a legislative authorization for money to be paid out at the Treasury. But what do these appropriations made by law look like? How does one determine when an appropriation is made by law? The first step is to understand the language used to appropriate funds in the laws enacted by Congress. This ability to read and understand appropriation language is a critical skill necessary to be an effective budget staff member. So what is appropriation language? Well, for our purposes, we'll define appropriation language as the words and expressions used by Congress in laws to make funds available to be spent from the Treasury. Such language fulfills Congress's Article I responsibility regarding appropriations made by law. We'll consider the language necessary for four basic types of appropriations regular appropriations, supplemental appropriations, continuing appropriations, and permanent appropriations. We'll cover these in a series of three modules. In module one, we'll look at the language in a regular or annual appropriation act. These are the most common means of providing appropriations. The language in Annual Appropriations Acts provides the authority for a single fiscal year, either before it starts, though this is very rare these days, or after it's in progress. Because Annual Appropriations Acts are now accomplished predominantly in consolidated or omnibus legislation, will contrast the minor differences between the appropriating language in a consolidated act versus the standalone appropriations. Module 1 will also include a discussion of supplemental appropriations. This type of appropriation provides additional resources during a fiscal year when, for example, an emergency arises for which there is not sufficient funding. Module 2 will cover appropriation language and continuing appropriations, commonly referred to as continuing resolutions. Continuing resolutions temporarily provide appropriations when regular appropriations are delayed. In HHS, this is a frequent occurrence, so it's important to understand the language differences between regular and continuing appropriations. On occasion, a continuing resolution is used to cover a full year, so Module 2 will also cover the type of language used for continuing appropriations that last the entire year. Modules 1 and 2 cover what is defined as current authority. Based on the timing of legislative action, budget authority made available by Congress for the fiscal year during which the funds are available for obligation, like annual appropriations, is defined as current authority. 
In contrast, with current authority, in Module 3, we'll talk about language that appropriates budget authority that's available as the result of previously enacted legislation and is available without further legislative action. This type of authority is defined as permanent authority. Let's begin with Module 1. Understanding appropriation language is critical in budget execution. It's through a careful reading of appropriation language that we answer the following important questions. Who is receiving the appropriation? What is it for? How much is being appropriated? How long is it available? What conditions are there on the use of the appropriations? As we talk about reading appropriation language, we'll keep these questions in mind. Before we begin to answer these questions by looking at regular appropriation language, we first need to define what we mean by an appropriation. GAO's glossary of terms used in the federal budget process defines appropriations as budget authority to incur obligations and to make payments from the Treasury for specified purposes. Put simply, an appropriation authorizes the government to spend federal money for certain purposes. The definition goes on to say, an appropriation act is the most common means of providing appropriations. However, authorizing and other legislation itself may provide appropriations. In this module, we'll focus on the most common means of providing appropriations, the Annual Appropriations Act. GAO's definition of an Appropriation Act also tells us it fulfills the requirement of Article 1, Section 9 of the U.S. Constitution, which provides that no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. This is a very important point. Since appropriations are a key requirement of the Constitution, it's important that we recognize when an appropriation is made. Well, what does Congress have to say about an appropriation? In 1906, Congress attempted to define the language needed to establish an appropriation. Here we can see the original 1906 language, and here's the codified version at 31 U.S.C. 1301d. A law may be construed to make an appropriation out of the Treasury or to authorize making a contract for the payment of money in excess of an appropriation only if the law specifically states that an appropriation is made or that such a contract may be made. So we know that the language used to make an appropriation must be explicitly stated. In addition, GAO's interpretation in their principles of federal appropriations law, otherwise known as the Red Book, includes the possibility that a specific direction to pay and a designation of the funds to be used would also constitute an appropriation, even if the word appropriation is not used. These requirements are the same for all appropriation language, whether it's found in a regular annual appropriation, a continuing resolution, or authorizing legislation. It just so happens that a regular annual appropriation act is designed in a way that makes it very clear when an appropriation is made. So let's take a look. We will soon see that there is a particular structure or anatomy to an appropriation act that has developed over the years. First, let's take a look at the important components of a regular standalone appropriation act. Then, 
because the norm for appropriations acts over the last decade has become the Consolidated or Omnibus Appropriation Act, we'll talk about the minor differences between the two. Once we've identified the elements of the structure, we'll go back and discuss each element. This is a slip law. That is, this is the first official publication for the FY 2006 Appropriations Act for the Departments of Labor, Health and Human Services, and Education, and related agencies. The slip law gives us a lot of really good information. The public law number, telling us this is the 149th law passed by the 109th Congress. The date of the bill, December 30th, 2005. A citation on the volume 119 and page 2833 of the statutes at large in which the law will appear. The bill number that was enacted, HR 3010, and informative marginal notes which among other things provide citations to statutes mentioned in the text. All Appropriations Acts have a form and style of their own, unlike other forms of legislation. They begin with an Appropriation Act title, followed by an enacting clause, and a statement of appropriations. In a standalone Appropriation Act like this one, the enacting clause and statement of appropriations is one long sentence. Appropriations Acts are divided into titles, typically, but not always, identifying a federal agency like the Department of Labor or Department of Health and Human Services. In some cases, titles identify a group of federal agencies. At the end of each title is a numbered section called General Provisions that apply to that title. In addition, the last title in each act typically contains another set of general provisions that apply to every agency covered by the entire act. We'll talk more about general provisions a bit later. Titles are divided into headings, which depending on the structure of the act, either identify an agency or a bureau within the agency, what we call in HHS an operating division or OPDIV. Here, for example, we see the Health Resources and Services Administration. Headings are divided into subheadings, identifying the next level. In this example, the appropriation account. In some cases, sub subheadings are used. We'll talk more about this concept of account when we get into the details. Finally, we find the appropriating language for each appropriation account. This language has a purpose, an amount, and if the period of availability exceeds the fiscal year identified in the Act title, a description of that period of availability. In addition, some appropriations have conditions added by Congress, identified as provisos. These conditions may be included in the appropriating language or added at the end of the title or act in the general provisions mentioned previously. In contrast to a standalone appropriation act, a consolidated appropriation or omnibus act includes the word consolidated in the title, a separate statement of appropriations, and separation into divisions. Let's go back and take a closer look at each component. The first standard component is the title. The format of the title is based on a rule established by Congress in what's known as the Dictionary Act, originally passed in 1871. The Dictionary Act prescribes the form and the rules of construction of the Acts of Congress. 
These rules were codified and enacted into positive law in 1947 into Title I U.S. Code. Here we can see the rule established by Section 105, and we can see that the language follows that rule. An act making appropriations for the Departments of Labor, Health and Human Services, and Education and Related Agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2006. Keep this date in mind as its significance will become known when we talk about period of availability. Note that with a consolidated or omnibus appropriation act, Congress simply adds the word consolidated to the title. For the last decade, most HHS funding has been appropriated in omnibus bills, so we'll focus on this structure. The second standard component is the enacting clause. The format of the enacting clause is also based on a rule established by Congress, codified in Section 101 of the Dictionary Act. This precise phrasing, be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, is the required enacting clause of all acts of Congress and has been used since the first act in the first Congress in 1789. The next standard component is the statement of appropriations. There's no rule in the Dictionary Act for this, but the statement structure that has evolved over time is the following sums are appropriated out of any money in the Treasury not otherwise appropriated for the fiscal year ending September 30th. Recall that Article 1, Section 9 states that no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. And Congress requires that the making of an appropriation must be expressly stated. With this statement, Congress is making it very clear that the funds are being appropriated in accordance with their constitutional responsibilities. While this particular wording has been used since 1798, it's probably overkill. Just saying the funds are appropriated would be sufficient. We'll go into a bit more detail on why these words are surplus in Module 3. The statement of appropriations can be done in a couple of ways, depending on whether it's a standalone appropriation act or a consolidated act. Here is the standalone version that the following sums are appropriated out of any money in the Treasury not otherwise appropriated for the Departments of Labor, Health and Human Services and Education and Related Agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2006. Note that Congress uses a single sentence and specifically includes the recipients in this version of the statement. Note the difference in the Statement of Appropriations for the Consolidated Act. Here it gets its own separate section and Congress does not even attempt to list all the recipients. Why is this? Because they would have to list all the appropriations subcommittees receiving appropriations. So who are these potential recipients? In order to understand the answer to this question, Let's talk a bit about the history of the Appropriation Committee. From 1789 to the end of the Civil War, the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee dealt with appropriations bills. In 1865, due to the extra workload created by the Civil War, the House separated the appropriating duties from Ways and Means and established the Appropriations Committee. The Senate followed by creating a separate Appropriations Committee in 1867. Initially, there was only one appropriation bill for the entire government, but the numbers grew over time. Today, 
there are 12 separate appropriations bills. This list shows the current 12 appropriations subcommittees that handle these 12 separate appropriations bills. The names are the same in both the House and Senate. HHS funding is directly appropriated in three of these bills. The Agriculture or Ag Bill, the Interior Bill, and the Labor, Health and Human Services, Education Related Agencies or Labor H Bill. Recall that the statement of appropriations varies slightly depending on whether the bill is standalone or consolidated. While the standalone bill typically identifies the recipient of the appropriations in the same paragraph as the statement of appropriations, the consolidated or omnibus bill uses divisions to identify all the different bills covered. For example, in the 2015 omnibus bill, there were 17 divisions, A through Q. The Appropriations Acts appear in 11 of these, A through K. If you're wondering why there aren't 12, it's because in this FY 2015 sample, the Department of Homeland Security did not receive full year appropriations until later. FDA appropriations can be found in Division A, Title VI of the Ag Bill. Indian Health Service appropriations can be found in Division F, Title III of the Interior Bill. There's some also some NIH and ATSDR funding in Title III. The remaining Health and Human Services appropriations can be found in Division G, Title II of the Labor H Bill. As you can see, each division is divided into titles. Within Division A, which represents the Agriculture, Rural Development, Food and Drug Administration and Related Agencies Appropriation Act, there are typically seven titles. We are primarily interested in Title VI, Related Agency and Food and Drug Administration. We'll also want to look at the general provisions in Title VII and because a special eighth title was added to the 2015 bill for Ebola funding, we'll also need to pay attention to that. Within Division F, which represents the Interior, Environment and Related Agencies Appropriation Act, we are prim primarily interested in Title III, Related Agencies which includes our Indian Health Service as well as some NIH and ATSDR appropriations. We'll also look at general provisions in Title IV. Within Division G, which represents the Labor, HHS, Education and Related Agencies Appropriation Act, there are typically five titles. HHS is in Title II and the general provisions are in Title V. A sixth title was added to the 2015 bill for Ebola funding. Within each title, there are headings representing bureaus, or as we call them, operating divisions. For example, within Title II of the Labor HHS Education and Related Agencies Act, there are 10 headings. HRSA, CDC, NIH, SAMHSA, AHRQ, CMS, ACF, ACL, Office of the Secretary, and General Provisions. You may be wondering why General Provisions appear in the title as well as in the heading. It's because there are two sets of general provisions in an act, those that apply only to HHS, which would appear under this heading in Title II, 
and those that apply to the entire act, which appear in Title V. Within each heading are the subheadings representing appropriation accounts. It should be pointed out that there are slight differences in structure between the three acts that provide direct funding to HHS. We have seen in the Labor H Bill that the titles generally identify a federal agency, like HHS in Title II, for example. The headings identify the bureau or optive, and the unnumbered subheadings identify the name of the appropriation account. However, in the Agriculture Act, the title identifies a group of related agencies in the Food and Drug Administration. The header identifies the agency, DHHS. The subheader identifies the Food and Drug Administration, and there is a sub-subheading for the appropriation account, salaries and expenses. The same thing occurs with the Interior Act. Again, the title identifies a group of related agencies. The header identifies the agency, DHHS. The subheader identifies Indian Health Service, and there is a sub subheading for the appropriation account, Indian Health Services. This gives you a general idea about how to find the regular HHS appropriation language. However, you should be aware that sometimes Congress appropriates funds in other sections of a bill. For example, as mentioned earlier, the 2015 Omnibus had supplemental Ebola funding in Title VIII of the Ag Bill and Title VI of the Labor H Bill. Okay. Now that we have a general sense of structure of the appropriations bills, let's focus on the appropriation account, the lowest unnumbered subheading. GAO defines an appropriation account as the basic unit of an appropriation generally reflecting each unnumbered paragraph in an appropriation act. Here are several of the unnumbered paragraphs the GAO definition is referring to. Each of these unnumbered paragraphs has a subheading telling us the name of the appropriation account. Each of these accounts is identified with a treasury account symbol. Treasury symbols for each appropriation account can be found in Treasury's Federal Account Symbols and Titles or FAST book. Note that the account symbol is made up of a set of seven digits. The first three digits, 075, identify the account as belonging to HHS. The last four digits have been assigned by Treasury to identify the unnumbered paragraphs on the screen. For example, 075-0872 identifies the appropriation for National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. 075-0873 identifies the appropriation for National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, and so on. These account symbols are very important in the accounting for the appropriations. We'll return to the account symbols a bit later. In all, there are almost 80 separate appropriation account titles in HHS that receive appropriations in an annual Appropriations Act. Let's summarize what we've covered so far. A regular standalone appropriation act starts with the title of the act and then follows with an enacting clause and statement of appropriations. Since this is a standalone appropriation act, the enacting clause and statement of appropriations are joined. In this example, the act is subdivided into titles. Title II is HHS, headings or optives, and subheadings appropriation account. A Consolidated Appropriation Act or Omnibus also starts with the title of the Act and then follows with an enacting clause 
but separates the statement of appropriations. Rather than name every appropriation bill, Congress makes a single statement encompassing all of them, which will follow in separate divisions. In both types of appropriation bill, standalone and consolidated, Congress makes a blanket statement appropriating the amounts to follow, thereby economizing on words. Having set the stage, let's now analyze the language in the appropriation account. Appropriation law requires us to meet at least three conditions to validly spend federal money. We have to obligate it for a purpose of the appropriation, within the amount of the appropriation, and within the period of availability or time period established by the appropriation language. When we read appropriation language, we need to identify these conditions in the appropriation language. So let's take a quick look at a simple sample of appropriating language. The first thing you will notice is that appropriation language does not appear to follow normal rules of sentence construction. Normally, a sentence contains a subject and a predicate, but this appropriation language leads off with a prepositional phrase for expenses necessary for the Office for Civil Rights and ends with a dollar amount, $38,798,000. A prepositional phrase typically follows the words that it modifies. So what is the phrase modifying? Recall that Congress tends to economize on language. The prepositional phrase that leads off each instance of appropriation language is modifying the initial appropriating language. The following sums in this act are appropriated. So the implied subject of each instance of appropriation language is sums. And the predicate is are appropriated. Let's map it out. The appropriating statement, which meets the constitutional requirement, leads off. The following sums are appropriated. Where from? out of any money in the Treasury not otherwise appropriated. For what period of availability? For the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2015. For what purpose? For expenses necessary for the Office for Civil Rights. And finally, what amount? $38,798,000. Okay, by reading the appropriation language as a whole, with all the relevant pieces, we find the purpose, amount, and period of availability. Let's discuss each of these elements in turn. First, purpose. One of the fundamental statutes dealing with the use of appropriated funds is referred to as the Purpose Statute. This statute was passed in 1809 and is codified at 31 U.S.C. 1301A. Appropriations shall be applied only to the objects for which the appropriations were made, except as otherwise provided by law. This purpose statement is a cornerstone of Congress's power of the purse. So, how do we determine the authorized purpose for appropriated funds? It's important to note that the purpose statute does not require that every item of expenditure be specified in the appropriation language. But there has to be a reasonable way to determine purpose. This reasonable approach, called the Necessary Expense Doctrine, is a three-part test. The expenditure must bear a logical relationship to the appropriation sought to be charged. That is, it must make a direct contribution to carrying out an authorized agency function. The expenditure must not be prohibited by law, and the expenditure must not be otherwise provided for. It's up to the agency to apply this test 
and develop an administrative justification that a given item is reasonably necessary to accomplishing an authorized purpose. This is done by carefully reading the appropriating language and, if necessary, consulting with the Office of the General Counsel. Let's take a look at some of the words used to establish purpose in appropriation language. By far, the most popular phrase for establishing purpose in HHS annual appropriations is for carrying out, followed by a description of the authorizing legislation for the program being funded. For carrying out language conveys that the appropriation is available to make payments for programmatic and administrative expenses of a program, in this case, Title 26 of the PHS Act, with respect to the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. The theory here is that if you're going to carry out a program like Ryan White, you need not only the funds for the program, but also for the infrastructure to administer the program. Note the use of for carrying out in the CDC language and in this ACF language. Approximately 72% of the appropriations in HHS annual appropriation acts use this for carrying out language to establish purpose. Since for carrying out is a broad statement, an in-depth understanding of the appropriate authorizing language is necessary to fully scope out the purpose of the appropriation. The second most popular phrase for establishing purpose, roughly 15%, is for necessary expenses. Here we see this phrase used in the general departmental management language. Note that here in the Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals language, the Congress can't seem to make up its mind about whether it's for necessary expenses or for expenses necessary. In the refugee and intern assistance example, we are back to for necessary expenses. But it really doesn't matter. Like for carrying out language, this captures both programmatic and administrative expenses. The previous Office for Civil Rights example also used this language to express purpose. For these types of accounts, one needs to understand the role of the receiving organization in order to fully articulate the purpose of the appropriation. Roughly 8% of HHS accounts fall into the category of for making some kind of payments or grants. Here we see for payments from the Vaccine Injury Compensation Trust Fund. And here we see for making payments to states. And here we see for making grants to states. It should be noted that making payments or grants does suggest that these funds may also be available for some administrative expenses, but the language is not as clear as for carrying out or for necessary expenses. The remaining grouping, about 5%, belongs to the buildings and facilities accounts in FDA, Indian Health Service, CDC, and NIH. This language covers the gamut of buildings and facilities purposes, planning, constructing, repairing, maintaining, renovating, and so on. As you can see from these examples, Congress identifies the purposes for which they are appropriating funds, albeit using broad terminology. Of course, these purposes require knowledge of the appropriate program authorizations. If you have any specific questions about whether the funds you are spending are for the appropriate purpose, always consult your General Counsel's Office. Now, let's take a look at amount. We can see from some of these examples that the amount typically follows the purpose in the appropriation language. In these cases, the amount is clearly stated. So 
we refer to these as definite appropriations. But what if the amount is not specifically stated? In these examples, note that Congress appropriates both definite and indefinite amounts. Indefinite amounts are identified by the term such sums as may be necessary. You may also see the phrase such sums as may be required. This such sums language appears in appropriations of mandatory programs, typically entitlements, where the precise amount cannot be known in advance by the appropriation committee. This is a good time to point out that appropriations may be classified in two ways, discretionary and mandatory. Most appropriations made in annual appropriations acts are classified as discretionary. That is, Congress has some discretion in the amounts to be appropriated. Some appropriations do not allow discretion. The appropriations for such programs as grants to states for Medicaid are provided in annual appropriations acts, but the level of spending is not controlled through the annual appropriations acts. Instead, it's based on the benefit and eligibility criteria established in law. Even though Congress appropriates specific amounts, they always provide such sums language to allow for payments that exceed estimates. Because the Appropriations Committee really has no effective control over the cost of these programs, they're classified as mandatory. Another term used for these types of programs is appropriated entitlements. We'll get into more detail on this topic in Module 3. Now that we've covered the purpose statement in appropriations language and the amount, what about the period of availability? In the interest of economy of words, for those amounts appropriated to be available for only one fiscal year, Congress does not bother to state this in the individual appropriating language. Both the title of the act and the statement of appropriations have already told us the funds appropriated in the act are for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2015. In addition, there is a requirement at 31 U.S.C. 1301 C. 2 that says an appropriation in a regular annual appropriations law may be construed to be available continuously only if the appropriation expressly provides that it's available after the fiscal year covered by the law in which it appears. Finally, just to make sure nobody missed it, there is a general provision telling us that no part of any appropriation shall remain available for obligation beyond the current fiscal year unless expressly so provided herein. But what might expressly so provided look like? An expressly so provided statement would typically follow the amount in the appropriating language. For example, to remain available through September 30th, 2019. In a 2015 Appropriation Act, this tells us these funds are available to obligate from October 1, 2014 through September 30, 2019, a total of five years. Congress tends to provide a longer period of availability for buildings and facilities accounts. Likewise, through September 30, 2016 in the 2015 Appropriation Act would allow a period of availability of two years. Available until expended language means that there's no time limit on the obligation of these funds. So. The general rule on period of availability is this. If there is no mention of a period of availability in appropriating language in an annual appropriations act, the funds are available for only one year. 
But what if funds are appropriated for different periods of availability within the same unnumbered paragraph? How do we distinguish these? In order to answer this question, let's first review how Treasury establishes appropriation accounts. If the appropriation language is silent on period of availability, like this example of the FY 2015 John E. Fogarty International Center appropriation, we know the period of availability is only one year, FY 2015. Treasury adds a two-digit fiscal year number between the agency identifier and the four-digit Treasury account code to identify the account as an annual or one-year account. Note that OMB uses a slightly different format with a four-digit fiscal year at the end. This addition of the period of availability creates the Treasury Appropriation Fund Symbol or TAFs. If the appropriation expressly states that the period of availability is for more than one year, like this example of the FY 2015 NIH Buildings and Facilities Appropriation, the TAFs reflects a multi-year account with the first year of availability, 2015, and the last year of availability, 2019, separated by a slash. Again, the OMB format places the availability code last and uses a four-digit fiscal year. If the appropriation expressly states that funds are available until expended, as with this example of the payments to states for child support enforcement and family support programs, Treasury uses an X as the period of availability identifier in the TAFs. When appropriation language expressly states that only a portion of the appropriation is available for more than one year, as with this global health example, we have to get out our calculators. Why is that? Let's take a look at the language. In the FY 2015 Global Health Appropriation, we can see a total appropriation of 416,517,000, of which 128,421,000 is available through September 30, 2016. Congress is not doing the math for us here. We have to subtract the amount expressly provided for two years from the total amount appropriated. This leaves us with 288,096,000 available for the default one year. And we can now see the amounts by TAFs. In this example of the FY 2015 Healthcare Systems Appropriation, we can see a total appropriation of 103,193,000 of which 122,000 is available until expended. We have to subtract the no year amount from the total amount appropriated, leaving us with 103,071,000 available for the default one year TAFs. Since the TAFs is the basic accounting entity used in budget execution, it's critical that amounts be properly identified by period of availability. Now that we've discussed purpose, amount, and period of availability, let's talk about provisos. A proviso or provision is a condition that Congress places on the appropriation of funds. It's an old stylistic device that is still used in appropriation language. Provisos in unnumbered paragraphs pertain only to that account. Provisos can serve a variety of purposes. These are the most common examples. As an earmark. As a prohibition on the use of funds for a particular reason, like abortion. As authority to augment the appropriation with collections from other federal accounts or the public, 
as direction on how to use funds or authority to override requirements or conditions in authorizing legislation. As authority to transfer funds to another account. As providing a period of availability of more than one fiscal year. And requiring congressional notification for certain issues. These conditions are identified by the word provided in italics, preceded by a colon and followed by the word that. If there's more than one, subsequent provisos are identified by provided further in italics. Let's first talk about earmarks since these make up the majority of provisos. GAO defines an earmark as a designation of a portion of a lump sum amount for particular purposes by means of legislative language. In order to make sense of the need for an earmark, first we need to understand the difference between a line item and a lump sum appropriation. Back in the day, when the federal government was much smaller, line item appropriations like this one from a 1905 appropriation to the post office department were very common. As the federal government grew, lump sum appropriations became the norm out of necessity. A lump sum appropriation is defined as an appropriation that covers more than one program, project, or activity. However, in many cases, Congress might not want to provide as much flexibility to the executive branch as a lump sum appropriation would allow. So they use earmarks. It's important to note that Congress must use appropriation language, that is law, to rein in the executive branch's flexibility. Report language or budget submissions or things like that are not sufficient. Here we can see that the emerging and zoonotic infectious diseases account is earmarked to ensure that $30 million is used for the Advanced Molecular Detection Initiative. And in the Injury Prevention and Control account, $20 million is earmarked for an evidence-based prescription drug overdose prevention program. Note the slightly different wording in the maternal and child health example. Not more than 77,093,000 shall be available for carrying out special projects of regional and national significance. This not more than language is referred to as a ceiling or cap. HRSA could spend less than that but not more. This type of earmark is more flexible than an earmark that states funds shall be for or shall be available for, as we see in the other examples. Here we see no more than language establishing ceilings, and we also see not less than language, which establishes a floor. In other words, at least $165 million is to be obligated as base grant adjustments, but there's no limit other than the total amount. GAO refers to not less than language as intended to serve a protective purpose. That is, to ensure at least a minimum amount would be available for a particular purpose. In addition, not less than language provides clear authority to supplement this minimum amount with other more general appropriations. Here's a general summary of the possibilities for establishing earmarks. Appropriation language like up to $100 or not to exceed $100 establishes a ceiling or a maximum spending of $100. This permits flexibility to spend less than $100 if you choose, even $0. Language like not less than $100 establishes a floor or a minimum of 
This permits flexibility to spend more than $100 if you choose. $100 shall be for or shall be available for or shall be used exclusively for establishes a floor of $100 and typically provides a ceiling of $100. This language generally permits no flexibility. However, there is a nuance to the use of this language that you should be aware of and GAO decisions have indicated some vagueness determining maximums and minimums using this language. For example, a recent GAO opinion suggest that such an earmark with shall be available for language coupled with an extended period of availability would only limit the amount available for the extended period of availability and not constitute a line item limitation or cap on the amount. All of these nuances suggest it's important to pay very close attention to the wording in order to determine how much flexibility you may or may not have in the amounts made available. When in doubt, always get OGC advice. Provisos have many uses besides earmarks. In this family planning example, we can see how Congress uses a proviso to prevent something, in this case spending money for abortions. In this ACL example, we can see how a proviso provides the authority to transfer funds to the Secretary of Agriculture. In these examples, we can see how provisos can provide authority to credit user fees to an account. And here, provisos provide authority to collect funds from other federal appropriations under the authority of Section 241 of the PHS Act, otherwise known as PHS Evaluation Funds. I should also point out that provisos can provide a valuable locating device. Note in this example from a FY 2011 full year continuing resolution, how the order of the provisos is used as a way of identifying the language that needed to be amended. Here we see reference to the third proviso and here the sixth proviso. This is just a sampling of the different provisions that Congress adds to appropriation language. But you should also be aware that Congress also exerts its power of the purse by adding provisions of a more general nature to appropriations acts called, what else, general provisions. So let's take a look at general provisions. There are several sets of general provisions that you need to be aware of. First, there are general provisions that appear at the end of each title within an Appropriation Act. These provisions affect only that title within the Act. These provisions are numbered based on the title in which they reside. For example, HHS general provisions are numbered in the 200s because they are at the end of Title II. Second, there are general provisions that appear at the end of each Appropriations Act, which apply to all the appropriations within the Act. These provisions are also numbered based on the title in which they reside. For example, Labor H general provisions are in the 500s because they are in Title V. Finally, there are government-wide general provisions that appear in Title VII of the Financial Services and General Government Act that apply to the entire federal government. As a reader of appropriation language, you need to be aware of all the provisions that affect your accounts. Let's first take a look at a sample from Title II the HHS Appropriations Act. You'll recall that these provisions affect only HHS. 
out of the 30 general provisions in Title II in our sample year, there are three general categories. Those that are positive, that is, they permit you to do something. Those that are negative, meaning they restrict you from doing something. And those that are neither. Let's take a look at some positive provisions. Section 201 allows a small portion of appropriated funds to be used for official reception and representation expenses. Section 205 allows up to 2.5% of amounts appropriated for PHS programs to be used for evaluation of the implementation and effectiveness of programs. Authorizing legislation allows only 1%. Section 206 permits the Secretary to transfer up to 1% of discretionary funds between appropriation accounts. Section 222 even appropriates an additional $305 million to CMS program management account. However, note that there is a proviso preventing these funds from supporting the Affordable Care Act, that is Public Law 111-148 and 111-152. Section 225 permits NIH to keep payments for research organisms for two years. Let's take a look at some negative provisions. Section 203 prohibits paying the salary of an individual through a grant, for example, at a rate higher than executive level two. Section 209 restricts family planning funding unless certain conditions are met. Section 217 prohibits funding for promoting gun control. Section 227 prohibits using any funding to pay for funds owed under the Risk Corridor Program authorized by the Affordable Care Act. The remaining types of provisions do a variety of things. Section 218 requires a website to provide information on the uses of funds under Section 4002 of the Affordable Care Act, the Prevention and Public Health Fund. Section 219 directs the transfer of the prevention funds to specific HHS accounts. Section 224 renames the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. That provides a sampling of the types of general provisions that follow the HHS Appropriations Act. These 12 provisions make up about 40% of the HHS general provisions. The sample year of 2015 has 29 general provisions in Title V of the Labor HHS Education and Related Agencies Appropriation Act. By their placement, these apply more broadly to the Departments of Labor, HHS, Education, and Related Agencies. Except for Section 501, which allows the transfer of unexpended balances, most of these general provisions are negative. For example, Section 502, which we've seen before, reminds us funds are available only for one year unless stated otherwise. Section 503 prohibits the use of appropriated funds for publicity or propaganda purposes. Section 506 prohibits the use of appropriated funds for abortion. Section 508 prohibits the use of appropriated funds for human embryo research. Section 521 prohibits the use of appropriated funds for distributing sterile needles or syringes. Section 529 prohibits giving any money in any way to ACORN. Some reporting requirements are imposed. Section 514 establishes reprogramming notification requirements. Section 516 requires operating plans. Section 523 requires a quarterly report on the status of balances of appropriations. <laughs>
and some funds are rescinded in sections 520 and 522. The sample year of 2015 has 50 general provisions in Title VII of the Financial Services and General Government Appropriations Act. By their placement, these apply to the entire federal government. These provisions are generally prohibitive. For example, 701 requires a controlled substance policy. Section 702 limits the amount that can be spent on a motor vehicle. Section 710 limits the amount that can be spent on redecorating. Section 715 prohibits spending funds for publicity or propaganda. Section 736 prohibits spending funds for painting portraits. There are reporting requirements like Section 739A, which requires reporting on conferences costing more than $100,000. In addition, Section 739E requires that funds spent for travel and conferences comply with OMB Memorandum M1212. This incorporation by reference of the OMB Memorandum made lack of compliance an ADA violation. And there are some positive provisions like 706, which allows agencies to use funds collected through recycling and waste prevention programs, and 722, which permits breastfeeding in federal buildings. Keep in mind that these are just a sampling of the three levels of general provisions, federal agency, appropriations subcommittee, and government-wide. The intent is to give a flavor of the number and types of provisions that appear. And while we're on the subject of general provisions, I should point out that since an appropriation act is for a single fiscal year, the general provisions in the act are presumed to be effective only for that year, unless the language used or the nature of the provision makes it clear that Congress intended it to be permanent. So how is this accomplished? Well, there are certain terms that can make a general provision affect more than one fiscal year. That is, they give the provision futurity. The most common are hereafter, thereafter, and subsequent. Let's look at some examples. Note that the word hereafter, which basically means from now on, makes this provision effective for the current as well as any future fiscal years. In this example, we see the phrase, and for each fiscal year thereafter, again telling us Congress meant for this provision to continue into the future. This example uses the phrase, under this act or subsequent acts. There are other terms. You may also see, after the date of approval of this act, henceforth, with respect to any fiscal year, and so on. I should point out, however, that the term here in after does not connote futurity, as it only refers to what follows in the current act. To illustrate how important it is to carefully read the general provisions, note this language. This limits the payment of compensation to consultants and scientists appointed under certain conditions. The futurity language in this provision was overlooked and thereby caused many Anti-Deficiency Act violations to have to be reported. The important thing to remember is that in order for a provision to affect more than one fiscal year, Congress has to explicitly say so. And when they do, you must take special notice that the provision continues to be adhered to in the future. 
Well, this wraps up our discussion of regular appropriations. But what about supplemental appropriations? OMB defines supplemental appropriations as an appropriation enacted subsequent to a regular annual appropriations act when the need for funds is too urgent to be postponed until the next regular annual appropriations act. What makes these different from regular appropriations? A supplemental appropriation provides funds in addition to those already enacted in an annual appropriations act added while the fiscal year is still in progress. This is usually done when the need for funds is unanticipated and too urgent to wait for the next annual appropriations act. Emergencies related to recession or disasters or national defense. As a general rule, the structure of a supplemental appropriations act is very similar to the structure of a regular Appropriations Act. They begin with an Appropriation Act title, followed by an enacting clause and a statement of appropriations. They are divided into titles, and at the end of each title is a numbered section called General Provisions that apply to that title. But there are two key differences to the appropriating language, one in the title and the other in the unnumbered paragraph language. Let's take a look at the differences. This Supplemental Appropriations Act was passed in fiscal year 2007 to cover a multitude of emergencies, the global war on terror and the Hurricane Katrina, among others. The first difference we note is that the Appropriation Act title uses the words making emergency supplemental appropriations and additional supplemental appropriations for agricultural and other emergency assistance. This clearly identifies this as a supplemental appropriations act. Note that the enactment clause and statement of appropriations use this standard wording we have seen in regular appropriations acts. Note the change in wording in the unnumbered paragraph. For an additional amount to carry out Section 501. This language is very important since it makes it very clear that these funds are added to amounts previously provided, carrying the same requirements from the regular Appropriation Act. Provisions or conditions may also appear in Supplemental Appropriations language. And keep in mind that if the supplemental appropriation is for the same purpose as one made in a regular appropriation act, then conditions in the regular annual appropriations act will apply to the supplemental funding as well. Note that there are also general provisions. Section 10001 concerning the availability of funds should look very familiar as it's similar to the language used in regular Appropriations Acts. But notice Section 10002. This provision designates the amounts in the Act as emergency requirements. Because of the requirements of the Budget Enforcement Act and amendments, supplemental funds are typically exempted from counting against budget ceilings. This is a very significant supplemental appropriation, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. Again, we see the magic words that denote a supplemental appropriation, in this case for job creation, among other things. This bill, the emergency designation, appears in Section 5. Note that the statement of appropriations is the same as we have seen before. Here we see a sample supplemental appropriation for HRSA. Note the terminology for an additional amount. The last example is the Hurricane Sandy supplemental. 
Note the language making supplemental appropriations and the familiar statement of appropriations. Here is a supplemental appropriation for the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund. Note the for an additional amount language. In this bill, the designation of an emergency requirement appears at the end of the unnumbered paragraph. This slide sums up critical elements of appropriation language for regular and supplemental appropriations. Notice the slight wording differences between the standalone and consolidated regular appropriations language and the supplemental. The enacting clause, statement of appropriations, and default availability are identical in all three cases. All three have unnumbered paragraphs. But the supplemental uses for an additional amount to clarify the supplemental funds are in addition to regular amounts appropriated and thereby have to follow the same requirements. As a wrap up of module one on regular and supplemental appropriations, let's review the questions we posed at the outset and summarize where the answers to our questions can be found. Question one, how do we determine who is receiving the appropriation? If the Appropriation Act is standalone, the Appropriation Act title and statement of appropriations will typically identify the appropriation subcommittee. In this example, the Departments of Labor, Health and Human Services and Education and related agencies. The Roman numeral titles identify the federal agency or group of agencies. The heading identifies the bureau or optive within the federal agency and the subheading identifies the account name. If the Appropriation Act is consolidated, the major difference is that there's no identification of the appropriation subcommittee in the Appropriation Act title or statement of appropriations. Rather, the division identifies the appropriation subcommittee. A Supplemental Appropriations Act typically follows the same structure as the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Question 2. What is the appropriation for? Typically, whether in a standalone, consolidated, or supplemental appropriations act, the purpose statement is the prepositional phrase that leads off the appropriating language in the unnumbered paragraph with such words as for carrying out, for expenses necessary, for making payments, and so forth. Question three, how much is appropriated? This amount typically follows the purpose statement. Here we can see examples of definite amounts. In some cases, when the amount is for an entitlement program like Medicaid and not known in advance, Congress may use the phrase such sums as may be necessary to indicate what is referred to as an indefinite appropriation. These amounts are determined by agencies and subsequently approved by OMB and Treasury. Don't forget that amounts in supplemental Appropriations Acts are in addition to regular appropriated amounts. You should also be aware that on occasion, Congress may have multiple purposes and amounts within the same unnumbered paragraph. Here we can see amounts for multiple purposes. For expenses necessary to support countering biological, nuclear, radiological, chemical, and cybersecurity threats, 848,154,000, of which 415 million is for advanced research and development, and 5 million is for emergency operations. For procuring security countermeasures, 255 million. 
And finally, to prepare for an influenza epidemic, 71.9 million, of which 39.9 million is specifically earmarked for vaccines, and so forth. It's also important to note that amounts may be identified in a proviso, as in the case of this $5 million. You can see why it's important to read appropriation language very carefully. Question four, how long is the appropriation available? We have learned that the default period of availability in a standalone consolidated and supplemental appropriation act is one year. But we also know that Congress may otherwise specify a period of availability. When this is done, this language typically follows the language specifying the amount. Note, for example, 415 million of the 848,154,000 shall remain available through September 30, 2016. This tells us this amount is available for two years. Note also that 5 million for emergency operations shall remain available through September 30, 2017. These funds are available for three years. The 255 million for security countermeasures is to remain available until expended. That means there's no time limit on the availability of these funds. 39 million 906,000 of the influenza funding is also available until expended. So, how much of the appropriations made to the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund in 2015 are annual funds? How much is no year? If you would like to see if you can calculate these amounts, just pause the video for a moment. We can see that a lump sum of 848,154,000 is appropriated in the first unnumbered paragraph. But 415 million is available for two years, and 5 million is available for three years. That means that 848,154,000 minus 415 million minus 5 million, or 428,154,000 is available for one year. But notice that the third unnumbered paragraph appropriates 71,915,000, of which 39,906,000 is no year, leaving 32,009,000 available for one year. The total amount appropriated for this account for one year is therefore $460,163 million. The no year amounts, 255 million in paragraph 2 and 39,906,000 in paragraph 3, total 294,906,000. Finally, question 5. What conditions are there on the use of the appropriations? Well, there are several places to look for conditions or provisos. Whether it's standalone, consolidated or supplemental, first look at the appropriation language itself. Look for the italicized provided and provided further, as these identify the following words as a condition of the appropriation. Read the language carefully. These provisions pertain only to the unnumbered paragraph in which they appear. Then remember to check all possible general provisions. First, the general provisions that appear at the end of each title within an Appropriation Act. General provisions affecting HHS appropriations appear in Title VI of the Ag Agriculture Act, Title III of the Interior Act, and Title II of the Labor, HHS, Education, and Related Agencies Act. Second, there are general provisions that appear at the end of each Appropriations Act, which apply to all the appropriations within the Act. General provisions affecting HHS appropriations appear in Title VII of the Agriculture Act, 
Title IV of the Interior Act, and Title V of the Labor HHS and Education Act. Third, there are government-wide general provisions that appear in Title VII of the Financial Services and General Government Act that apply to the entire federal government. Finally, don't forget the general provisions that appear in supplemental appropriations. Well, this wraps up Module 1. Next up, Continuing Appropriations. Next up, Continuing Appropriations.